um, good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Yitong Chen. I am a PhD student here at the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department of University of Washington. I am the student leader of uh, Accelerating Quantum Enabled Technologies graduate program. It is a great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Dario Gill as our esteemed guest for the very first uh, University of Washington public lecture in quantum science and engineering. Dr. Gill is IBM's senior vice president and director of research, one of the, one of the world's largest and most influential comp corporate research lab with over 3,000 researchers. Dr. Gill has made substantial contributions in multitude of areas, including AI, semiconductors, quantum computing, and many more. Under his leadership, IBM was the first company to build programmable quantum computers and make them universally accessible through the clouds. This inspired me to delve into research in quantum information and engineering, and more importantly, allow students like me across the world to learn, explore, and experiment with quantum computer even without access to a dilution refrigerator at home. <laughs> we are privileged to have someone of Dr. Gill's caliber to launch this exciting uh, public lecture series in quantum science and engineering. And I have no doubt that his insights will be both enlightening and thought-provoking. Before I pass the floor to Dr. Gill, I would like to extend my gratitude to UW Quantum X and Accelerating Quantum Enabled Technologies Graduate Program from, for sponsoring this event. And also to Professor Kai Mei Fu from the Physics and Electrical and Computer Engineering Department for building this uh, wonderful quantum com community here at UW that makes this event possible. And of course, to all of you for joining us today. Without further ado, I invite Dr. Dario Gill to share his exp expertise with us. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yitung, and, uh, and to Ben as well, and to the students from uh, this incredible university, and to AKET for inviting me in this inaugural lecture. Um, I have to say I've had a delightful day, uh, you know, having discussions with, with the students and being walked around this gorgeous campus. It's my first time that I've gotten a chance to visit uh, your university, and it's just been a wonderful day. Uh, to learn about some of the activities you have in quantum. Uh, let me see if I can uh, advance. Okay, perfect. So I'm delighted to uh, be able to spend uh, some time with you to share some of the advances that are happening in the world of computing and very specifically on, in quantum computing. Since you're in such a beautiful place, I thought I would start by sharing where I work. Um, this is the research headquarters of IBM. It's about 45 minutes north of New York City. Uh, also a beautiful place, it was uh, a building that was designed by Eero Saarinen, the great Finnish-American architect. He also designed Bell Labs uh, as an example in addition to the San Luis Arc and many other modernist uh, pieces of architecture. This building opened in 1961, um, and IBM Research itself uh, has been around within the IBM family uh, for close to 80 years. Uh, it originated adjacent to Columbia University, and then in 1950s, that building that you saw got commissioned. And uh, it's part of a global network of laboratories uh, that IBM, who has been, of course, in the world of computing for over 110 years, um, uh, that we operate all over the world. I'll show you some pictures in a second. And one characteristic that the research division has is that it's very eclectic in terms of its background of scientists. Uh, so we have lots of you know, physicists and material scientists and mathematicians, but also engineers of every type and designers. And uh, we pursue a broad range of activities. I mean, ranging from the physical sciences and semiconductors to quantum, of course, which we'll spend some time talking, to artificial intelligence, to cryptography and uh, security research and, uh, and many other areas. 
Um, so just a bit of a visual tour of the network of labs. Uh, we operate a, you know, a very significant laboratory jointly with MIT devoted to AI. Uh, in California, we have uh, Almaden, a little bit south of San Jose. Um, Albany has become the sort of uh, ecosystem and the hub for a, a very advanced semiconductor research for logic and, uh, and chiplet scaling in the United States and internationally. Uh, our laboratory in Zurich that opened in the uh, mid-1950s, very well known for many seminal advances in nanotechnology. And uh, our laboratory in Haifa uh, also is an example. So as I mentioned, this community comes together for a purpose. And the purpose is to always be imagining what's next in the world of computing. And if I were to summarize very simply what is going on in the world of computing, I would say that is bits plus neurons plus qubits coming together in a hybrid architecture. And what I mean by that is I'm going to unpack very briefly the first two topics, and we're going to spend the majority of the time talking about the world of, of qubits. Uh, but to understand the implications of quantum computing, it is very useful to actually ask ourselves the question of what is the nature of information? What is information and how we define it? And of course, if we look at the modern um, world of computing that we have built, um, it really has been based historically on the idea of the binary, the idea of the digital. And that modern introduction of the binary notation, as we now understand it, originated from the great German uh, philosopher and mathematician uh, of the 17th century, who famously also was co-inventor of calculus along with Newton. And he was fascinated by this idea of a binary representation of knowledge that we could encode all the information that existed, put it in this string of essentially zeros and ones. And he had this ambition that ultimately that we could embody perfect rationality with it, that we could imagine and he anticipated the possibility of all sorts of sophisticated calculators and, and advances that would allow us, once we've mapped it to this binary sequence, to do that. Now, that sort of original inspiration really got codified uh, in a much more sophisticated fashion mathematically by Cloud Shannon. And Cloud Shannon famously defined that information is the resolution of uncertainty. And also gave us the core foundation to actually be able to, for example, among other things, reproduce information perfectly. And, um, and, and this sort of conceptualization of the mathematical expression of the idea of the binary is what then introduced into the world popularly the idea of the bit, the binary digit, and this lens with which to sort of separate the physical manifestation with which we can compute or process information and generate this abstraction, right, almost this platonic ideal of representation of information as zeros and ones divorced from the physical manifestation was a core assumption of information theory, of what will become known as classical information theory. And in a minute, we will revisit whether that separation between physics and information was right. But for the sake of argument at the moment, he sort of strongly separated uh, physics and information. And in fact, this lens of information is what allowed us to look at objects as different as, let's say, an old punch card uh, and DNA, and even though they are so physically different, we have both as sort of like in a modern identity have come to appreciate the fact that they are information carriers and that they are information systems. So in that sense, that abstraction was enormously useful to understand and have a common language for information, how we store it, how we process, how we reproduce it, and who, how we decode it. There was a companion empirical idea that went along with this information theory construct, and that was, of course, Moore's law. Uh, the inventor of the transistor in the you know, uh, mid-1950s, and the advances in the planar process to be able to fabricate you know, millions and billions of these transistors, fast forward to today, has allowed us to essentially digitize the world, make bits, I'm not gonna say free, but almost free. And this has, of course, been driven by an incredible amount of scientific and technological innovation 
across a huge variety of institutions all over the world. I would just highlight that if you just look at transistor count on the y-axis, look at in 1970s, a microprocessor or a small chip would have a few thousand transistors, and now we're in the realm where we routinely build chips that have tens of billions and even hundreds of billions, and we will see these decade chips that have a trillion transistors or so. So it's been a spectacular cumulative achievement of scientific and engineering institutions over many decades with literally trillions of dollars of investment uh, that have made it happen. Now, another idea, this is the second part of my pseudo equation of neurons, um, that is also important because it's shaping the modern world also so profoundly, was the, um, the original insight of Santiago Ramón y Cajal, who uh, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, um, he um, was among the first, really, to understand that in the cell structures present in animals, we have these structures called neurons, and these neurons have these long tails called axons, and that when axons meet one another, they form synapses, and that that network of synapses is essential for uh, the processing of memory and learning inside biological, um, you know, for animals and so on. He was also incidentally a wonderful illustrator. Those are his hand drawings that he would do while looking under the, the microscope. And with not much more than that biological inspiration in the 1940s, mathematicians created an abstraction called artificial neural networks. And we got, began to see diagrams like the one you see here where neurons are the black dots and neurons are organized in layers of networks. The lines represent the synapses, quote unquote, and the process of learning, by example, is the process of learning the strengths of the connections between the neurons, kind of essentially the thickness of those lines and that through this iterative process of showing examples, the network can be trained and the weights can encode the information that is necessary to ultimately um, you know, create representations of the world. Now, this, I, I bring this one up because this sort of intersection between the idea of, of bits, the idea of encoding them in transistors and scaling transistor technology, but now also combining that logic with neural network architectures is really shaping the modern day of computing and the modern day of, of AI nowadays. And um, you know, as an example, right, uh, on this convergence, last year we announced, uh, we launched a product called IBM Z16, um, which actually combines, you know, with many tens of billions of transistors, not only very high precision computation for transaction processing, but also AI cores that implement natively these neural network architectures that are at the heart of AI. So one trend that you're definitely gonna see, it's much more heterogeneous environments that combine this world of high precision on artificial intelligence being blended together. And for example, you know, we put one of the things you can do with it is these kind of systems that, that we build in IBM, um, you know, power 70% of the transactions around the world so there's you know, $800 trillion uh, worth of daily transactions that are processed with these kinds of systems. And one of the things that allows you to do is that within the window of each transaction, you can run an AI model to do things like fraud prediction and prevention as an example. So we are going to continue to see not only the scaling of technology, we also uh, demonstrated um, uh, a couple years ago and, and was recognized last year as one of the best inventions of the year, um, the scaling of transistor technology down to uh, you know, two nanometer node, you know, and, um, and we're working on, on scaling beyond. Today for production, high volume production, the kinds of devices you have in your phones and so on, it's around seven nanometers and, uh, you know, and beginning the five nanometer high volume production. So the only point I wanna say is that there's gonna be multiple generations still of semiconductor technology for the coming decade and beyond that will continue to scale the power of bits. So I give this as context setting because it's hard to, we're gonna move into you know, quantum computing. It's good to sort of put it in contrast of what are gonna be the difference of a different representation of information, but also as a reminder that as powerful as the technology we're gonna talk about, it is gonna be in concert with the advances in semiconductors, high performance computing and AI that is gonna shape the, the present and the future of computing. But we go back to Shannon, 
And we go back to that idea of it was mathematics and information that gave us this world of bits. And it is going to be physics and information that is going to give us the world of qubits. And one fundamental aspect of quantum information theory, as opposed to classical information theory, is actually going to be to revisit that core assumption that Cloud Shannon made of separating the physical implementation and information. And as I will discuss, it turns out to be that information is physical and that there is a deep connection actually between physics and how we represent information. And as a consequence of all of this, it is the wrong way to think about quantum computing as just another step on Moore's law, as just another way to deliver a faster computer. Yes, it is true that for certain problems it is a faster computer, but in fact, we should be thinking about quantum computing as the first time that the category of computing itself has branched. This doesn't happen very often, so moving forward, we will have classical computers and quantum computers. They are each very different in the category, and they will work in concert. Now, to motivate as to why we care about it is that if you look at the problem of what kinds of things can we solve with computers, and if you look at this question from a complexity theory perspective, it turns out that classical computers can only solve exactly easy problems. Now, that doesn't mean easy problems for us humans, but it just means easy problems defined in the context that the number of variables that you have to compute over is not exponential. Now, there are many problems in the world where the number of variables that you have to compute over turns out to be exponential. And there are mathematical problems of that kind. There are problems about modeling the physical world that are of that kind. And there are different classes of complexity, right? I mean, NP-hard problems is an example of complexity. Uh, but there are other problems around uh, with different complexity classes. And what is interesting about quantum computing is that it's the only technology that we know that alters the equation of what's possible to solve uh, exactly, and, you know, and, even, and even like with good solutions with approximations compared to classical computers. Now notice I am not claiming that quantum computers can solve all hard problems, but rather that there's a subset of hard problems that we care a great deal in the world that will be possible to solve with quantum computers. So in that context, it's extremely interesting. When we ask the question, and we're going to give an example now of factoring, which is a, a very well-known example in the field. And if you ask the simple question of, is a quantum computer faster or slower than a classical computer? The answer is, it depends. So for example, let's take this very simple problem of multiplying two numbers. P times Q equals N. Well, if I say, hey, I want to multiply two numbers, how well can I do it in a classical computer versus a quantum computer? It turns out that a quantum computer is really terrible at doing multiplication in terms of speed compared to a classical computer. But if you go and ask the reverse problem, if I say, well, I give you the product, right? I give you N, find for me P and Q. It turns out that if N is sufficiently large, and those two are prime numbers, uh, P and Q, finding those P and Q takes billions of years uh, in a classical computer and can be done sort of exponentially faster in a quantum computer. So in one direction is much lower, and in the other direction is much, much faster. So that's a very interesting uh, set of properties. By the way, this problem has huge implications for the modern world because encryption, specifically asymmetric encryption, which is the hallmark of how we secure digital transactions and your bank accounts and medical health records and all sorts of things, actually depends on the asymmetry of this problem. Depends on the fact that that right-hand problem is hard to solve for classical computers. That's how we say that the public key, which is N, is safe, right? Because we can put it in an open channel, and it's very hard to find our two private keys, which are P and Q. So there's a tremendous world implication of having computers 
quantum computers are fast enough to solve this problem exponentially faster, one consequence of it is we're gonna have to change, change the encryption protocols of the world as a consequence of uh, future quantum computers. The good news is that there's a solution to that problem, right? There's like quantum safe uh, cryptographic algorithms. The bad news is a lot of work to do to change all the encryption in all the systems in the world. Now, the way a quantum computer, and we're gonna go into a little bit of detail on, on how that works out, is that it solves the problem entirely different than what a classical computer does. So, so we'll say more in a second, but essentially what a quantum computer is doing in this context is it acts as a computational interferometer that maps the problem in a way that you have a pattern of frequencies and you are basically uh, able to reveal the periodicity that is present in uh, this new representation as a mean to extract the answer to the problem. So it's just to give you a, a brief insight that you actually have to think very differently on how you represent the problem to exploit the power of quantum computers. So in this context, by mapping the problem and executing things very differently, you end up with something that you're sort of taming an exponential, right? And in this case, you can solve um, in polynomial time. So where does the power come from? I mentioned this linkage between physics and the idea of information itself. So there's three key concepts that we gotta bring to bear to actually understand quantum computing, and they are the principles of superposition, they are the principles of interference, and the principle of entanglement. Now, this comparison between bits and qubits, we're gonna have a little bit of a graphical representation around that. In the world of bits, it's very simple, right? You have two states. So if we represent it here with this circle, you, a zero is in the you know, uh, North Pole, uh, one is in the South Pole. In quantum, we're gonna represent it with a sphere. And now, we actually can have these sort of combinations of those two states present in here. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that we also get to do is not only do we have to have sort of this linear combination of states, but let's say in this example, um, in my representation of my sphere, that one state, I not only get to position it wherever I want in the sphere, I also get to have a face present in there, here depicted by a little rotation that you see some blue and some pink. And uh, that's another uh, characteristic with which I can represent information. So for example, if I do a 180 degree rotation of um, the, the one state, I can have a zero minus one state present in there, right? So I can have combinations of zeros and ones, and I also have this phase that I can introduce in there. So the principle of superposition is that I can have a zero state, a one state, and then I can add them up and have a combination of zero and one. And as I mentioned, I can, for example, introduce another operation in my machine, uh, which in this case happens to be a Z operation, which is a rotation. And in this case, I have a zero minus one state, okay? Um, so the principle, and you're gonna see how they add up these, these things in a minute, the principle of interference we're all familiar with, there are waves in the ocean, is the idea that you can have constructive interference that forms peaks, and that you can have also destructive interference that sort of forms valleys, and you can cancel out. So one of the amazing things that you get to do in the world of quantum information and quantum computing is you get to cancel information too. So for example, if I have a zero one state and I add it to a zero minus one state that had had this rotation that I had done, and I add them up, I end up with a zero state. So that's a very interesting power. By the way, both superposition interference are classical phenomena as well. Um, so there's actually a third element in this equation that is a truly quantum phenomena that is at the root of the very special properties and power of the world of quantum, which is entanglement. Um, Schrodinger, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a notoriously tricky concept to talk about. It's been all sorts of, uh, sorts of discussions over many, many decades, but it's beautiful and fascinating. I describe it as that the best possible knowledge of the whole does not necessarily include the best possible knowledge of its parts. And um, we're gonna try a little experiment, and it's gonna be a journey of this story in the world of quantum physics of the origin of the idea of entanglement, the criticism of entanglement by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and others, 
and a journey of proving, right, and debating the nature of entanglement, but we're gonna do it also by running an experiment uh, in a quantum computer life, right? So let's hope to the demo gods that uh, things work. So for now, don't pay much attention to, uh, let me see, I, you know, you don't have to understand all of this for a second. I'll go back in a minute to explain, but I'm gonna launch a little program here that is gonna run in a quantum computer and um, while I tell the rest of this story, and then we're gonna come back uh, to hopefully see some results. Okay, all right, so while that's running. Okay, so what are we gonna do behind the scenes? So I was in this laptop, there was a little program there uh, that has been executed. We just sent zeros and ones over the internet to one of our quantum computers in New York. We've converted those zeros and ones to microwave pulses, they operate about five gigahertz. We're sending those microwave pulses down a cryostat to a quantum processor. Uh, this quantum processor is creating this superposition and interference and entanglement operations. Um, at the end of running this program, we're gonna perform a measurement, we're gonna amplify the signal through the cryostat, and we're gonna return the answer back to the computer, right? So that's what's running behind the scenes. Now inside this quantum computer in IBM, we use superconducting. Uh, technology, there's different ways to build quantum computers. You can use ions, uh, neutral atoms, all sorts of uh, spins, lots of things. For us, we use superconducting uh, technology. Uh, this is a model of what the inside of a quantum computer, they don't really exactly look like that anymore. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, uh, you know, those cables that, um, that you saw there are the coaxial cables in the original implementation that send those microwave pulses. And at the very bottom of it, you saw a little shiny square that is a quantum processor. In our case, we use uh, a device called the Transmon qubit. It's a Joseph Subjunction uh, style device. You see an SCM cross section there on the upper right hand side. It's about 100 nanometers by 100 nanometer structure that um, it has um, you know, metal and an insulator and a metal, aluminum, aluminum oxide, and aluminum. And basically what you, what you do with this device is that um, you create essentially like a virtual atom, a very well-defined two-state system that has your ground state and your excited state, and that is the origin uh, of, of you know, a, a necessar necessary element to build a quantum computer is to have a very well-defined two-level system. Um, I mean, in our case, it works by you know, having these Cooper pairs uh, of current flowing back and forth between this junction and uh, it allows us to have those two level systems. And then you need to couple the devices to one another. And there's different ways to be able to do that and different techniques. But you know, those wiggly lines as an example that you see on the diagram on the left is the microwave resonators. Again, there's many different sort of technologies that one can use. Um, but that is a means to create sort of two qubit and um, um, pairs and entangle uh, devices. So anyway, that's a little bit of what things look like, but we go back to, um, to this idea, to this experiment. Where does entanglement uh, come from and why is it necessary in the world of quantum? So uh, in the 1930s, um, Einstein was uh, really bothered by this idea of entanglement, and he proposed a very famous thought experiment um, known as the EPR paradox, uh, where it basically says, well, you know, so, so let's say this is right, so imagine that you have two particles, let's say two photons, and they're in close proximity to each other in such a way that they're entangled, and we separate them to uh, very far distances, let's say to two ends of the universe. And, um, and look, you know, if you actually treat the system as independent and not as a whole, and you just look at one particle alone, we know, um, by, by the way, the overall entangled state is in a definitive state, but if we just treat it as one particle in itself and we perform a measurement, um, to us, it's gonna look individually random, right? So it would be the equivalent of saying if we have a coin and, uh, you know, it's heads or tails, but we know that while it's spinning, in some ways, it's in a superposition of heads and tails, but when we perform the final measurement or we let it settle, right, it's gonna be in a state, but it's random. Sometimes it'll be heads, sometimes it'll be tails. But now, in entangled world, when we actually have to consider the system as a whole, and as I said, it is in a definitive state, but if you go on now and treat the system as a whole and you perform a measurement on one of the particles, in this case, let's say, uh, you know, the particle on, on the left, and you measure its position or speed, you will instantly know the position or the speed on the particle on the right. 
And again, just by the crude analogy of our coins, that would be the equivalent as if, if we had two coins that were entangled and we perform a measurement on both, we would end up in a situation where, for example, when you know, one was heads, the other one was always heads, or one was tails, the other one was always tails, and it always happened. And this, if you actually reflect on it, seems to violate some fundamental sort of intuition of how the natural world works, right? And this really bothered Einstein, right? And he says, this cannot be, right? I mean, there has to be something that is incomplete in quantum, in, in quantum theory, right? And, and sort of like part of like the idea that he proposed was to say there has to be some hidden variable that is present in the system that quantum mechanics is not accounting for that explains these kind of correlations that happen at great distances because if not, you know, we have to give up something, right, that, you know, that we came to determine that you would have to give this sort of causality uh, of local action. And he says, like, that cannot be, right? So he put this out, and um, a few decades later, uh, John Bell um, sort of took that idea very seriously and, and put forth uh, work and, uh, and paper that basically said, actually, there's a way to actually measure this, and we can imagine, and he put forth a set of mathematical equations, a set of inequalities, that basically uh, would be able to determine whether this hidden variable theory of Einstein was right or not. And that you could perform a measurement and if the correlations that you saw and you measure between the photons exceeding a certain threshold, you would say, well, you know, then this hidden variable uh, idea uh, cannot, be, cannot be right and, uh, and, you know, and that quantum mechanics does not need hidden variables to explain uh, these, these correlations. And after putting for that work, there were a number of physicists that took on the experimental effort of doing these demonstrations, um, including here like John Clauser and Alan Aspect and Anton Zellinger and their collaborators, and they were recognized by you know, last year's Nobel Prize for conducting those experiments. Right? So if you actually run those experiments, you end up getting something like this, where like, you have a rotation uh, over the measurement, and you get a, you know, let's say a curve like the blue plot that you have here. And um, a Bell violation is uh, measurements of the correlation between those particles and their states that exceed a certain threshold. And the threshold is depicted by the red line. So if you end up with measurements that exceed what you're seeing over the red line, you end up with this violation and you end up basically saying this kind of like no hidden variable is needed in quantum mechanics. So this is what is known as a violation of, of Bell inequality. And this journey that took so many decades and you know, Nobel Prize winning experiments uh, to be conducted and so on um, is something that we just run on a quantum computer, right? So we were able to create uh, qubits, right? Uh, be able to entangle them and, um, and basically uh, run an experiment of uh, Bell violation that you're seeing here the result, right? So, I think this is really exciting, right? To, um, to be able to see that this journey and the level of effort it's required is literally at the hands of all of you, of every student, right, and faculty and researcher around that. And that what it tells us is that there's these fundamental properties that quantum physics has revealed to us now for over a century that we can express now in this world of information and made available through technology, through quantum computing. Now, this power of entanglement that we just talked about and, and, and revealed has a you know, direct connection with the amount of information that we can represent in these systems. And it goes as follows, basically. If you're able to build systems, let's say with 100 qubits, and let's imagine for a moment that they were perfect qubits, which they're not, but imagine that is. The number of states present in the machine is two to the n, where n is the number of qubits. So when you have 100 qubits, that means that there are more states that you can represent in the machine than there are atoms on planet Earth. By the time you have, you know, say 280 qubits, it's more than there are atoms in the known universe. Meaning that if you wanted to mimic the number of states present in the quantum computer, you would have to devote, you know, sort of every, every atom of planet Earth to store bits, right? So that's the size of the classical machine that you would have to build. So in a classical computer, you have bits as inputs, strings of zeros and ones, and bits as outputs, 
But the intermediate representation is just an n bit. And if you want to double the power of a classical computer, you're going to double the number of transistors, essentially, right, by and large, right, double the number of bits. In a quantum computer, you also have a string of zeros and ones that go in. And in the end, you're going to get a string of zeros and ones. But the intermediate representation is 2 to the n. And that's where you have this exponential that is present in there that if you map the problem properly, you actually get to solve uh, in an efficient manner. Now, notice that one of the things that this also implies is actually um, a quantum computer is really not a big data machine. Right? It's not about like ingesting massive amounts of data and output, you know, also massive amounts of data, but rather is about representing information very differently. But you got to be clever about what problem you're sending to it. So in general, it's not about sending big data into it, but problems that require a huge exploration of the parameter space uh, present in there to discover an answer. So now we have all the ingredients to develop an intuition for how an algorithm works in quantum computing. And it's as follows. So you build this uh, machine, these qubits, and uh, the first thing that you do is you put the quantum computer in all its available states. Meaning, if you, let's say you have a two qubit machine, you have two to the power of two, it's four, so you have four states that you get to represent. So that is depicted here on that you know, sphere. So you say, machine, put yourself in all your available states that you have. The next step is you say, I got to send data into the computer to represent the problem I want to compute over. In practice, loosely, what this means is those states that I have represented. Remember, I told you that I could put them anywhere in the sphere I wanted. And also, I could do rotations. So in practice, sending data into the quantum computer means you know, uh, as an approximation, a phase rotation, right? Changing those little moons, right, from pink uh, to blue and, and changing that. So that is about encoding the problem. And once my data is represented in the machine, the art of writing an algorithm is actually to take this process of taking those states that have amplitude and phases, in fact, like, you know, com with complex numbers, and interfere them with one another, like waves in the ocean, such that the right answer is maximized and, pro and areas I don't care about get canceled out. Remember when we got a chance to see the diagram where we could cancel information? This is this process of constructively interfering the states present in the machine to actually give you the answer that uh, is, is uh, the right one for the problem. So the richness with which we can represent information from a quantum algorithm perspective is very, very different than the richness with which we can represent information in a classical system. So, okay, given that basis, another element of progress in the field is our ability of not only to realize these principles of technology, but to build a community, a community of, of experts, of curious people that actually advance the technology in its own right. And um, you know, sometimes through theory advances, algorithmics, sometimes through heuristics. So that was at the root of our desire to expose the technology, even in its early phases of maturity, to the world. So in May 2016, uh, we put the first programmable quantum computer on the cloud. And you had a program that looked like the right-hand side. Like you could literally, uh, in a, you know, you could draw gates. Remember I showed you, for example, a gate with a Z rotation and so on, but there's many, many gates that are present in there. Just like in classical computer, you have ands and ors and nots and so on. And uh, you could run your gates and you could press go and uh, you would run your program. And this is what happened. Um, so before that, I don't know, the number of people that could run like multi-qubit experiments, I don't know, maybe were like you know, 20 groups around the world or something like that that they could have access. But we made this available, and this is the community that we have been building you know, uh, since. You know, there was over half a million people all over the world uh, that have run you know, over two trillion circuits uh, on, uh, on quantum systems. There's been over 2,000 scientific publications now uh, over the last um, you know, number of years, since 2016, um, that are using this as a new scientific instrument. Right? as a new way to exploit quantum information and advance many different areas uh, of science. And you can see this growth, this exponential growth that is happening here. Um, we also had a strong commitment towards open source, so we created a project called Qiskit. 
um, that um, allows you, uh, it's basically a quantum SDK, right? It's a, it's a mechanism uh, to go all the way down from very low level access to the devices to higher levels of abstraction. And there's been a wonderful community, and, and including here, right, you know, in the discussion with some of the students, uh, you know, seeing how uh, Qiskit is being, is being used and so on. And there's a tremendous amount of energy uh, in the community all over the world. I mean, I'm highlighting this because technology is incredibly important and the devices and the stack, but also the talent dimension of it and having a community that contributes to it and supports each other and learns from each other uh, through summer camps, through certifications, through curriculum development all over the world is actually one of the sources for me and for the team that derives the most energy um, and, and sort of passion on this topic, right? So a tremendously uh, fast-growing community all over, all over the world. And in fact, as a consequence uh, of all this progress, there has been, I give you here, uh, a sample of quantum innovation centers that we have established in universities and in national laboratories and in regions all over the world. So there's 37 um, you know, of them so far and, um, and growing, including the fact that we have been able to build um, you know, systems. So we operate, I think, I think it's 24 or 25 quantum computers on the IBM cloud that supports uh, the global network. But we've also um, you know, built systems that we're able to deploy physically in some of these, uh, on some of these centers. So the one you're seeing here is literally inside the lobby of the Cleveland Clinic. So it's, but it's a good illustration of uh, taking it out entirely out of a laboratory setting, right? A system that works 24-7 uh, around the cloud and provide access to the wonderful collaboration we have with them. In fact, we've installed now six um, of, um, of this instance since uh, we put the first prototype with Fraunhofer in Germany, um, in, uh, in Tokyo, uh, that we put our first one, and there's more coming in the Cleveland Clinic in Canada, and then next year we will you know, operate in Jonsei and the Basque uh, country, as an example. So now the classes of problems uh, that the community and all these institutions are solving, I would say broadly map into three categories. One is simulating nature. You know, uh, you know very famously also attributed uh, in part to uh, you know, Richard Feynman in, in his discussions about the possibilities of, of, uh, of quantum computing, where he had that great quote, right? He said, nature is in classical, damn it. And if you wanna make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. And what he was basically saying is like, look, if you want to model many of these physics problems in the world and other ones, they obey quantum mechanics. And we have machines that you know, are not well suited to actually implement those quantum mechanical processes. Could we build machines that actually work uh, like you know, obeying quantum mechanics? And then that would allow us to model things. So, so then you see industries, for example, uh, you know, like Boeing uh, here, you know, or Samsung or Bosch or many others that rely on advances in chemistry or material science or physics to their success. So that is one cluster of industrial use cases, things that rely on modeling the physical world. Data with complex structure is a second category. The example I gave you of Shor's algorithms with factoring is an example of finding complex patterns inside data. But there's other examples of a new field like, uh, called quantum machine learning that is also emerging and applications around that. And uh, that's why you see many financial institutions, for example, also present in the network because they're very interested in problems on finding structure in data. And then these problems related to search and optimization. Now, those do not offer an exponential advantage compared to uh, classical methods, uh, and, but rather things like quadratic and so on. So, uh, but also, you know, those are important for a, for a number of, of industries. Now, let me touch, um, you know, quickly on one of the big challenges in quantum computer is dealing with errors, right? Part of the, the art of building a quantum computer is this uh, tension between isolating the system such that you can create this superposition and entanglement. But if you isolate the system completely, you cannot send data in and out. Uh, from the system. And what happens is that you have this incredibly powerful information representation in the form of entangled qubits, but they're also fragile and delicate in the sense that external fields can couple to your entangled qubits in such a way that they make them decohere, right? And uh, you lose the information. So you have to deal with errors, right? Errors are present 
uh, in classical computing too, but you know, they're of course present in, in, um, in quantum as well. And, uh, but in quantum you have all sorts of other problems too. Because in a classical computer, you can implement error correction by copying the state. So for example, I can you know, check the state of my processor, I can copy into memory, and I can do sort of error checking as an example between memory and the state of the processor. In quantum, I can't, right? This you know, theorem called a no cloning theorem, like you cannot say an intermediate state when I have my two to the end representation, copy the state into something else. In fact, just to give you an intuition for, uh, you know, for many of you is like, I'm sure everybody has heard about Heisenberg uncertainty principle and that sort of this act of observation alters the state. The act of interrogating the qubit as to say, hey, do you have a bit flip or a face error? That act of querying it makes the whole thing decohere. So it's a real problem. Thankfully, there is a solution to this problem um, in terms of how you can do it. And, uh, but for example, before I talk uh, you know, towards the end very briefly about error correction, um, you can implement techniques, even with current machines, uh, called error mitigation. And here, basically, what you do is instead of executing a single circuit, you execute a collection of related circuits, and then you combine uh, the output in post-processing to actually sort of learn something about the errors present in the system and mitigate them. So for example, again, another very simple intuition, you could run at um, sort of that middle point on that linear curve, you perform uh, a circuit, you run a circuit, there's an error present in the machine around that, and you get a measurement. What you can do is run the circuit again, but at twice the error rate. And you say, well, how do I generate twice the error rate? You can actually, I told you that you have pulses that you send down the cryostat to be able to control the qubits. So you can, for example, stretch the pulses and you can control that in such a way that you introduce more errors in the machine. So now you get a second data point. And just in this case, very simplistically, if you have two data points, you could extrapolate down to the zero noise example, right? So I say, ah, that's my zero noise estimate. So you're essentially doing some characterization of the machine in such a way that you're able to suppress the errors. And essentially, based on this technique, um, uh, the team uh, uh, published uh, a few months ago, it was on the cover of Nature, uh, this technique of implementing these error mitigation and error suppression strategies um, on a device that had over 100 qubits, right? So basically you can now run a reasonably, you know, it's a shallow circuit, but like it's still of reasonable depth, where the entire circuit had been error mitigated, right? Uh, even, like I said, well before we have full error correction. So as a consequence of that, we made an important business decision that also is gonna have scientific implications, is that basically, we started in 2016 with this sort of hello world examples of like, hey, you know, run your toy problem and run it and so on. And we've entered now a phase of maturity where basically we think this hello world, you know, phase is over, right? That doesn't mean people are not gonna continue to do hello worlds, but it's kind of over. And we made a decision to up, upgrade the entire fleet of quantum computers to over 100 qubits, implementing also this error mitigation and error suppression. So in some ways, we find ourselves at this moment where if you plot simulation cost, the cost of running computation, as a function of quantum circuit complexity, that's a measure of how well suited is the problem to run on quantum computers, right? If you have a low quantum circuit complexity, you can just run it on a classical computer. But for problems that have highly entangled states, um, you move to the right. And we know that with classical systems, you get the black curve, right? You have this exponential uh, that grows very quickly on you. Ultimately, once we have a quantum error corrected machine, we will traverse the blue curve, right? So the, the cost of adding complexity of it will progress linearly as opposed to exponentially in terms of cost of compute. But what we are going down the journey is down the green curve. Eventually, we're gonna get to the blue curve, and I'll say something about that. But basically, we are at the point that we have built now technology that is sufficiently sophisticated and advanced that we can start traverse, traversing that green curve. And we're very excited about that. And we had actually some fascinating conversations today also uh, with some faculty members um, you know, here that actually go, are gonna go down this journey too. And we have formed working groups um, on this topic from finance to materials and high performance computing uh, to high energy physics and healthcare and life sciences devoted to this idea of 
let's start working on problems that actually require 100 plus or you know, uh, qubits with you know, these error mitigation and error suppression techniques such that we start traversing that green curve, right? And I think this is gonna be an area where the first demonstrations of quantum advantage are gonna happen, right? And you know, so we're sort of in, in, in that cusp and there's a lot of excitement around that. But what is beyond? Well, beyond this, um, we laid out a roadmap a few years back, which we sort of update periodically, says that as best as we can tell, we can share with the world uh, where we think we will be on a year-by-year -year basis on the advancements of quantum computing. And you know, I, I, you know, I'm not expected for you to read all of these details. I mean, they're published online. But basically, it says at the bottom that we went from 27 qubits to 65 to 127 to 433 to over 1,000 this year. The check marks means things that we said before and we've delivered. And, um, and then above it is the software stack that goes from kernel developers to algorithms developers to model developers. Kernel and algorithm developers definitely need to know quantum mechanics, right, to participate in developing new algorithms or, or new uh, circuits. And above it, you don't need to know any quantum mechanics, right? You can just be a user of the technology and, uh, and benefit from the entire software stack. And what I would say about roadmaps that is very interesting and a big part of the culture inside IBM Quantum, uh, borrowing from the roadmaps we had in the semiconductors for many decades, is that a heck of a lot gets done in a decade, right? This is what a qubit in IBM in Yorktown looked like in 2010. And the right-hand side is a 433 uh, qubit processor. So basically, we have gone from you know, basically very simple devices to now fully integrated package systems where we have broken the plane and we're separating the qubit plane and the IO plane and the readout plane uh, you know, with superconducting through silicon vias and you know, uh, amazing amount of technology and packaging technology that we brought to bear. So an extraordinary amount of, of sophistication has taken place in and the quality of the qubits, right? In the, again, you know, if you look at, for example, uh, coherence as a measure, right? So when the first superconducting qubit uh, was invented by Nakamura when he was at NEC in Japan, uh, it was one nanosecond, for example, the coherence time. We have built devices now that routinely exceed now uh, millisecond, right? Uh, coherence time for superconducting technology. Error rates, when we put the first quantum device on the cloud had error rates of a few percent. Every 100 operations, there were a few errors, right? Now for uh, you know, two qubit devices, like we're in the threshold of, you know, for significant devices, of having 10 to the minus four error rates, right? One in 10,000 operations. So this tremendous amount of progress across all of these dimensions in terms of the fidelity and the error rates. But where we're going is all about modularity. So we are in this journey of building very, very large quantum systems. And basically, it is gonna be based on having many quantum processors. In fact, each quantum processor is unlikely to have more than a few hundred qubits. And we will have many of these processors connected to one another. First classically, with classical information as connection, but also we are working simultaneously on having quantum mechanical connections of different kinds of couplers uh, from very short uh, distance, like you know, less than a millimeter distance in terms of, cap of coupling, uh, that allows us to have two qubit gate operations across multiple processors, to also different kinds of connectors that within very large cryostats allows us to have uh, inter-QPU communication that may be like 20, 30 centimeters in length around that. Um, this will be slower, right, compared to like the very near ones and with lower fidelity, but nonetheless incredibly important for scaling. And also longer term, um, um, uh, sort of communication devices that we will do. Ultimately, you know, we will also, of course, like to employ like transduction and you know, having long distance coupler. But basically the philosophy that we're going is around modularity and everything, right? Modularity in the building blocks, on the processors, and how we connect them with one another. And, um, and basically, kind of like the, the, the direction we're going is that in addition to this kind of standalone systems that you saw of quantum system one, the next generation of systems that we're already building, and we'll have the first one operational in November, I'll show you a rendering in a minute, is actually ones that blend significant amount of classical processors with quantum processors working with one another. And the process looks like this. You use a large amount of classical compute to take a, a circuit, 
you uh, parameterize the circuit, you break the circuit into many pieces around that, then you have Qiskit as a service that basically takes those chunks of circuits and runs it to many quantum processors working in parallel, and then you iterate this process of running, and then with classical computer, you reconstruct the answer. It requires a lot of cleverness of how you break the circuit, right? And uh, so there's a lot of sophistication on all of this, but basically what I wanna highlight is that it's a very complex system of many classical machines and many quantum processors working in concert as we see them. So this was the basis of us going back to the drawing board and going from quantum system two to, to quantum system one, which is that box that you saw, to what uh, is known as IBM quantum system two. And it is the system that is the basis of modularity and to build quantum-centric supercomputers. And this is a rendering of, um, of, of this system, and uh, we're gonna have it operational in November of this year, right? So it's in very advanced stages of, uh, of construction right now in Yorktown. And now that system is gonna allow us to then have modularity at the level of the systems themselves. So we will be able to sort of pack multiple of those systems connected with very large cryostats. The cryostat in there weighs 18,000 pounds, right? So there's giant uh, refrigerator systems uh, around that because we have to house many quantum processors around that. And, and that's what I was saying that, for example, those pictures I was showing you with the coaxial cables, they don't look like that anymore, right? Inside the, you know, the, the cabling, all of those stuff looks very different. So modularity on everything. And then the other big animal is, of course, error correction, right? So I, I show you that we have techniques to do error mitigation and error suppression. Um, there is an error correcting code that is very widely known in the industry and in, the, in academia, of course, which is the surface code. Uh, one of the co-inventors of the surface code, Sergey Bravi, you know, is one of our you know, great theorists uh, working in IBM research, but we've never liked the surface code. It has a huge amount of overhead. Right? It's very expensive to implement. And we're very excited, and I just wanna highlight for those of you who care about these things, uh, this paper um, about a different sort of like approach on, on how we're gonna pursue error correction. And just to give you just a hint for a minute around that, that the reason we're very excited in this direction with you know, LDPC codes that the team has put out is that if you look at the overhead of how many qubits you need to implement a logical qubit for the surface code, um, basically it's a 200, you know, 300 to one ratio or something like that, right? And, um, and in here uh, with these new codes and this new direction that we're going, the, rate, the overhead is essentially a factor of 10 lower than that. So it's roughly like you know, 20 to one around that. And uh, that has a lot of important implications, right? Uh, for, for how you do that. In fact, even though, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, you know, that to implement a large fault tolerant machine, you need uh, a million qubits and so on. Um, we have a different target and a different goal uh, to, to do that. And that requires lots of innovations, but including new codes to do error correction, which we're, gonna, we're, we're making fantastic progress on getting that. And that's why we have publicly put out the goal that we will build a 100,000 qubit machine um, uh, by 2033 at the latest. And, um, and we've announced you know, also you know, some great collaborations with different universities around the world. And it is at that scale, right? Once we're able to build large scale um, uh, machines that implement logical qubits that we will be able uh, to also address you know, the great promise of quantum computing, right? So uh, from you know, creating uh, new fertilizers that have hugely important applications to agriculture and feeding the world, uh, to new catalysts for industrial processes that are much more efficient, um, to you know, driving fundamental new insights in the world of physics and, uh, and, uh, and new discoveries in these areas that are important, uh, or developing novel materials for electrification and battery technology uh, in many areas, or, you know, like we're starting with the collaboration that we've done for now for a few years with Boeing and that we would love to continue with them and others to create lighter and stronger materials, for example, to create more efficient, uh, more efficient planes and things that are corrode less, as an example, or new classes on t of antibiotics uh, that are, you know, that can counter the emergence of, of drug-resistant uh, bacterial strains. So I'll, I'll end there. I'll just give you one last pointer of, you know, if some of you, there's you know, many publications obviously from IBM, but I'll give you, this gives a good uh, recent summary and overview of 
uh, the prospects for um, um, you know, advancing quantum computing with superconducting qubits that we put last year. And I give you a, a couple of other references that are important. And, um, and I'll close where I began, that as amazing as all this progress is, remember that the future of computing is going to be to exploit all the incredible advances of semiconductors and high-performance computing with artificial intelligence and quantum computing uh, working as a seamlessly integrated environment. And thank you. Um, so yeah, it is. Uh, I, I couldn't express how much that I enjoyed the talk. So thank you, Dr. Gill, very much. And I think you might also have a million questions you want to ask. So we have lined up the mics on two sides. If you have questions, you can just line up here. Um, uh, we'll take a few questions. And yeah, just go for it. So while the uh, audience trying to line up for questions, um, right, OK. Hi there, that was, that was fantastic. Um, so I've been wondering about uncertainty and probability, and I'm wondering if you could give us some insight into how a quantum operation could treat that differently than a classical operation, and if that could be used differently for something like different ways of thinking about intelligence or hmm. et cetera. Um, I don't know, maybe others have like good insights around that. I mean, one interesting aspect in terms of probability is um, a couple of the primitives that are inherently present in this stack is one is um, basically sampling from a distribution, right, and give you uh, samples, and the other one is give you observables, right? But in this link with probability, if you can sample efficiently from a distribution that is different than what you can do with classical methods, they may, that may have like very important implications, like to the extent that that sampling is efficient and, or, or representative of the largest population in ways that we don't have efficient access with classical computers. So that might be a direction that is very interesting, right, as a means of using these machines to sample, right, and, uh, and gives us uh, observation that, you know, today we use other methods to do that. Thank you. And if others, there's lots of experts here, so if others have ideas around that, I welcome it too. Go ahead. I have a quick question regarding the work that you do at IBM and sort of your journey. What does it take to become the director of research at a place where you're combining so many different domains together and you come from a graduate school experience where you have a certain expertise and then moving on to a position where you are leading and the industry leader in not just one domain but in several domains of research of which quantum computing is one. So what does it take to become or get your job? <laughs> okay, so um, um, let me think. Um, so I think one is, um, I mean, it was the benefit of for me to be in an institution that um, was curious and has supported doing that diverse lines of work, right? So it wasn't as if it was my creation to go and say, oh, let's work in all these areas. It was intrinsic and had been built there over many decades. Uh, you know, by many amazing people, right? And first and foremost, the scientists and the researchers and engineers that made it happen and they had, and they had the ideas. But to answer your question specifically, um, you know, you start by having domain expertise in a particular area, but, you know, in, in, in our institution, like in many others, we have a dual track. You have the track of advancing your career as a scientist or an engineer, and then you also have a management or a leadership track that is about leading teams, right? and enabling uh, the scientists and engineers to be more successful, right, uh, by collaborating with one another, allocating resources, et cetera. So I went into that, you know, early on in my career because I was interested in team building and, and so on into this management and, and leadership track. And, and then what it took to, you know, eventually get to my position is actually to move from area to area and be willing to go to different areas. So I started my first six years working in semiconductors, right? And um, so, you know, and my PhD was very related to that world of nanofabrication and lithography and so on. And, and, but at some point, even though I was successful doing that and leading a large team, uh, there was a moment where I said, you know, and, and thanks to the advice of other mentors and leaders, says, you gotta go somewhere else. You gotta go over here that I knew nothing about. 
And I had to go there and, uh, and learn about that. And instead of leading a very large team, I was leading a small team and learning around that and growing again. So I had to move many times across different areas and demonstrate that you have the ability, not that you are the domain expert in those areas, right? You rely on the brilliance of the scientists and the engineers that work on those things, but that you had enough curiosity, right, and empathy and desire to learn to actually um, help them be successful in different areas. And it was in the journey of doing that a few times over different areas that I think also then, you know, allowed me and, and, and you know, my leaders and my bosses at the time to be able to say, okay, well, you know, he's a good person to lead a diverse group of people and has had a broad range of experiences with the research uh, to be able to, uh, to do that. And then there's an element of luck too, right, on the whole process because there's aspects you don't control about it. You could do all of that, but it's a function of, you know, who's there before you and who your mentors and supporters are and like and who stays and who goes and there's an element of it that is not perfect to control so you know I've been fortunate also in that sense but I, you know of stars aligning but he went through a, this journey of learning from different areas and having experiences in different areas over time. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah so is this on? Can you hear me? I can um, hear you. Yeah. From an education perspective, one hears a lot about the need for, you know, building up a quantum workforce and the, the whole STEM watershed and pipeline building up from, in your personal opinion and also from an IBM um, perspective, when is a good age to start introducing some of the complex, nuanced ideas that you presented in this, by the way, amazing talk, thank you. Uh, when is, I've, I've heard controversy around if you start too young, you confuse them, you know, I, I've, what's your thoughts on that? I, I think it can be done early. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was today, there was a, a, a brief moment in some of the dialogue we were having, I was given this sort of analogy of, of something that has been a long dream of mine, which is if you look at robotics, and, uh, you know, many of, of you may be familiar with FIRST Robotics, and uh, it's this great program, right, that uh, was started a few decades ago by Dean Kamen and, and others, where he's basically exposing at a, you know, I mean, it's high school, but even in middle school, you know, it starts to, um, to robotics, and the idea was, like, make it fun. There's competitions, right? You have to build a robot, you have to work as a team, and then you compete with one another, right? And then, uh, and then you go, and, and, and the purpose of it wasn't to build that all of those students are gonna be roboticists. The purpose of, was to expose them to you know, science and technology and team building and, and, and so on and develop skills around that. And, um, and I guess where I'm going with that is that like, my dream is that I think like, this information lens and, um, and quantum in particular, is such a interesting, thought-provoking uh, lens with which we look at the world that maybe something like that is even possible to do. Like robotics. And again, not because we would try to teach all the kids to be, you know, quantum information or a quantum computer thing, but just because it's a rich concept and it's a rich way to, in, to interact and to learn and to learn to think differently. So, and I think that properly done, that could be done, you know, starting in middle school, right? And, and beyond. Certainly, it doesn't have to be something that it only gets exposed in college if it's done well. Obviously with, you know, tiering and so on, but that can be done, just like robotics was also done in a way that maybe 30, 40 years ago, we would say like, you mean you're gonna teach kids to build a robot? That's impossible. And you're like, absolutely we are, right? And we're gonna make it happen. So maybe something like that could be done. Yep. Uh, you talked about oh, how- uh, take a few more. Yeah. Okay. You talked about how quantum computers scare uh, and uh, how fast they scare in terms of the states that they have. Is it ever possible to use those states to create a form of storage that's like, like much greater than what classical computers could make? Um, to, you mean to build a storage device? Yes, for storage of information. Um, n not really, right? Because again, you have this problem of, of basically you create this entangled stain and then you can do an evolution of that state and then eventually perform a measurement to extract it out. Um, and 
whereas in a classical computer, at any gate, at, at any stage of the process of sequencing around that, you can store the states of the computer in a sequential manner. And uh, so you don't have the ability, right, at any given uh, representation to copy it and extract the state and then copy and extract the state and so on. So it's just like not well suited as a, as a memory device. Oh, because the information can only be extracted in sort of classical At the measurement, fashion. at the end. When you perform the measurement is when you're able to extract it. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, I have a short question. Uh, so you said that uh, the quantum computer can like, uh, use a result that get the vector. So is it possible that we can prove all the like math question in the world by, with a quantum computer? Um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, um, if you look at, remember that diagram of classes of problems that it could solve? There's many problems also from, uh, that are mathematical problems on sort of a complexity class um, that actually are not gonna be well suited also to uh, solve with quantum computers. So a subset of them will be able to be addressed, but others probably not. That doesn't mean we won't be able to approximate them with both classical and quantum machines, but you won't be able to solve it exactly. Thank you so much for your talk, Doctor. My one question is, uh, if you're familiar with the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics, do you disagree or agree with, with it? With the what? The Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. And if you disagree or agree with it, how do you think philosophically about the work you're doing and what quantum computing really means in a, a philosophical sense? Thank yeah, I, I have learned not to thread on um, those waters too much because uh, <laughs> so it's gonna be an unsatisfying answer right around that. Um, you know, I mean, obviously within philosophy of science, there's been a long running, you know, different ways of, of doing uh, these interpretations. But, um, you know, I personally don't have a lot of sophisticated things to say about it, right? Um, we are very much on the, uh, a bit on the camp of, uh, I know that has been jokingly on the shut up and calculate kind of thing and just do these things. But, uh, but anyway, I know it's not a satisfying answer, but I, I don't think I have anything smart to say about like the interpretations of it. Thank you. So because of the time, let's just take one last question. Yeah. Hi, so you mentioned about how qubits uh, can be utilized to develop biological drugs, um, enhanced uh, improved ones, um, and be able to apply it to the discipline of biology. I was wondering if you think that it will, it could also be applied to the discipline of neurology and uh, if it can, if qubits will be able to help with, um, I guess, developing machines to be able to uh, improve ana uh, neurological um, <clears throat> information, like such as MRIs, EEGs, like if, um, what do you think about that? Yeah, so, so look, I mean, ultimately, again, I give a general answer. I mean, quantum computers are a universal computer. I mean, like classical computers, you know, that we use today. So ultimately, you can map all sorts of problems to it. I think the question in the end is how efficiently you can run it. How long does it take? How much energy does it consume? How well it maps the problem? So with large enough quantum computers, there'll be, and to the extent that the phenomena that you are modeling, right, is, you know, strongly, has a quantum mechanical phenomena that is present in there, or you have a mathematical representation that is well suited to uh, what an efficient quantum algorithm looks like, you can make a lot of progress in that field. But those are all open questions, right? I mean, even for life sciences questions, we're gonna require more larger, much larger systems than you know, the current ones, because you know, they're larger structures, right? There are you know, larger molecules that are present in there and so on. Um, but that's what's gonna be the fun part of the whole thing, is part of it is what we do, working with many collaborators, which is build the technology. But the huge field, and maybe you know, I'll close with sort of that as an open invitation, the huge field moving forward is also about exploring the applications of quantum computers to new fields and to new areas. And to do it both, there's groups of people that do this with sort of very formal mathematical methods and proofs. And then there's a huge space that is gonna be very kind of like experimental and heuristic in nature of like trying problems and see what's a good fit for it and how 
where should you use AI instead of these techniques or high performance computing uh, for some of these techniques. And I think that's gonna be that journey of discovery of lots of clever people using this new tool to solve problems in a new way that is gonna be the majority of the innovation in the end of quantum computing, right? That technology itself will be an element that is indispensable because without it you couldn't do it, but the field of quantum computing needs to evolve such that the majority of it, it's about actually solving problems with it and, and doing things. So that's what's ahead, and, uh, and that will be perhaps the most fun part of it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, thanks, uh, Dario. That's thank you. And um, to conclude tonight, well, I'd like to thank all of the audience for coming in here tonight. And then we hope to see you next year uh, in the next year's uh, quantum um, science public lecture. So good evening. Thank you.